good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to um, Unlocking Nature. Uh, my name is Jackson, as you've heard from uh, Yuan, the manager at Parlema Conservation Area. I'll be talking about Parlema Conservation Area, um, you know, promoting coexistence of wildlife, people, and their livestock for mutual benefit. And that's the core business that we're doing here. Um, and before I dive into talking about the coexistence or how that works, I would want to probably um, let you uh, put into, into the context, uh, make you understand the location of the Paradama Conservation Area, the context of the uh, Africa map and the national map, uh, also map and also the uh, Mara landscape or Mara ecosystem. So uh, basically it's found in Kenya and uh, in a place called the Masai Mara uh, ecosystem. That's why the Panama Conservation Area is located. And uh, you can literally see uh, how, where it is located within the ecosystem. Uh, I'm zooming in into the map of the landscape or the Mara ecosystem. Uh, that uh, badge guy is Parliament. Um, and uh, I would spend a bit of uh, time discussing about uh, this. Uh, the brown area to the well, uh, to the left is a small. It's it's, it's called the wild beast breeding zone. In the Mara landscape, we normally have two migrations: uh, one from the south, which is the Mara, uh, the Serengeti migration, and also the eastern migration, uh, wild beast migration, which was called the later migration. Um, this breeding zone is threatened, it's actually lost, not even threatened. And Pardamat, securing Pardamat is just a step towards uh, restoring that lost migration in the landscape. Well, so as part of what we are doing, we are working towards securing uh, land for conservation uh, especially the areas of critical importance as far as uh, biodiversity conservation is concerned. Uh, I'll take you through the ecological importance of Panama conservation area. Um, one, it's a, a maternity or it's a breeding area for elephants. I know the word maternity could be a bit um, uh, uh, jargon. But it's a breeding. It's an area where elephants uh, breed. It's, a, it's an area where they bring up their calves. So uh, that's a picture of Panama just outside um, uh, the Wildlife Tourism College. You can see a lot of elephants with young ba uh, young calves, babies for that matter. So um, this is the kind of pictures that you find in Panama for the elephants. It's also a safe haven uh, for elephants. When I throw you back to history, before the establishment of Parlama Conservation Area, uh, this area was a hotspot for poaching in Kenya, where in, 20, in 2015 alone, we recorded more than 26, about 26 cases of uh, ivory co uh, poaching in PCA. And uh, with, our, with the establishment, working with the community, because this is not only the efforts of our uh, security teams, it actually took the um, the, the inf community involvement, stakeholder involvement, uh, and our security team to stabilize the security of elephants within this area. We have we were able to 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 reduce poaching from that number per year to zero from 2016 to date. And there, and that's why you will see uh, now big numbers of elephants within the conservation area. Otherwise, before elephants were, you know, uh, unsafe within the area, and therefore they couldn't spend more time within the conservation area. Uh, it's also um, a breeding uh, zone or a denning uh, uh, zone for the wild dogs. As you all know, the wild dogs are endangered, and there are not as many in the in the country, uh, or even um, across the conservation areas in Africa. Uh, and this area is providing a good home, not only for, it's, it's, a, it's a range for the wild dogs, but also a denning area. We have several active dens 
within the conservation area where uh, these wild dogs are raising up their puppies. Uh, Paranormal conservation area, it's also a northern corridor. Like when you take, I take you back to our, uh, our, the Mara ecosystem map, when you look at Paranormal conservation area, it sits very, um, it sits, it, it, it's, it's very central, centrally located between the southern and the northern conservancies. And therefore, uh, it's very important for that area to be secured. And uh, talking about this uh, particular block, when the, land, the, the landowners of a, a larger group ranch, which was called Koyaki Group Ranch, sat together uh, down and zoned the land, Panama, because of its natural, uh, I mean, richness in natural resource, was set aside for human settlement. When Naboisho Conservancy, which is to the south, Olari Motorogi to the west, Mara North to the north, were all uh, within the same group ranch, were set aside for uh, wildlife conservation. But with time, when people started coming in to settle in PCA in numbers, uh, moving in with their livestock, we, we realized a high, I mean, um, high pressure on the land, especially high competition on natural resources um, within the area, and therefore resulted into conflicts between the wildlife and the people living in the within the conservation area. For that reason, that resulted in now in high human wildlife. Uh, conflicts. For that reason, we then together with the community sat down, designed a conservation model, which we are now uh, implementing within uh, Pardamat. I, I talked about the natural resources, um, uh, and that's why we are now um, calling it a conservation area and not a conservancy. Uh, Pardamat is a mixed model conservation area. And the reason behind that is what I discussed, talking about it was an area that was set aside for human settlement for the landowners of all these other conservancies. And now that SANS was not integrated in the initial planning, we came to realize, uh, we came to realize uh, later on that the ecological value of this particular area, as I mentioned earlier, is of great importance to the survival of the Mara ecosystem. And that's why we are embracing a new conservation model, first uh, in the landscape and perhaps in Kenya, um, which is a, mix, a mixed model uh, conserv uh, conservation, which is being managed by the community. Panama conservation area is 64,000 acres in size with 850 landowners, all settled within the conservation area. They formed a trust and uh, organized themselves in, the, in that in a trust. They have 15 trustees, four of which are women, um, to, so that they can have an organization that they can put together, that can pull land together for conservation. And uh, we also have 26 rangers that are helping us to provide security within the, conserv the conservancy. The conservancy was established in 2016. And um, yeah, what we want to see is coexistence of the people, wildlife and livestock. These are uh, pictures taken within uh, from the conservancy. Uh, you see happy, communities or happy landowners dancing. You also see um, a, smiley, a smiling community. You also see wildlife grazing together with livestock. So this is what we want to see in Panama Conservation Area. And these are the pictures that we've collected as a result of the interventions that were already taken within the conservancy. However, we have quite a number of challenges that we are, are fighting. Uh, number one, uh, being fencing. Fencing is an ecological disaster within the landscape. It's causing wildlife death, loss of habitat, and there are quite a number of reasons why people are fencing. Uh, they are fencing to keep of, you know, to, to create grass banks for their livestock. 
like I mentioned, some of these landowners or most of them have set aside land for conservation, either in need of the conservancies within the landscape. And the portion of land allocated to any family within Parlama was set aside for settlement. And that's the reason why people would always say they would need to fence their land so that they can have grass for their livestock alone. They can have um, keep off their neighbors so that they can create grass banks for their livestock. They, would, they also wanted to keep off, especially the wild beast, away from the, their cattle because of well, the wild beast related diseases, which is another big challenge that we have in the landscape. Most of the landowners are losing cattle to uh, wild beast, uh, to, to wildlife related diseases, especially one caused by the wild beast, which is called uh, the malignant catarrhal fever. It's a virus uh, uh, found in the amniotic fluid of the wild beast during the calving season. And uh, yeah, during that time, uh, most of the landowners will lose their livestock uh, to, to that kind of uh, virus. And therefore, uh, that has prompted them to do a lot of fencing to keep off their wild beast uh, from their uh, uh, farms or from their land. Uh, but this is what you can see you can, uh, um, as a result of the fencing. You, you know, while wildlife are being killed by the fences, you can see a wild beast and two giraffes that are hanging in different uh, occasions and they were killed by uh, the, the, the fences. Uh, so because of that, I will come to that. Uh, the other big challenge that we have is uh, predation. Predation, uh, loss of life so, or, uh, to uh, predators is another big problem that we are facing in Parliament. The landowners of Parliament who have given their land uh, for conservation, who have tolerated this wildlife, are losing uh, their livestock in numbers, in big numbers. These are pictures that were taken recently taken in PCA of three uh, occasions or three uh, uh, different scenarios where a hyena got into the uh, sheep pens and killed uh, sheep in numbers. And therefore the families are losing a livelihood which they are dependent to uh, 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 facilitate their families, uh, hospital bills, education for their kids, housing for their families, uh, and even food. So it's really a big challenge that we are facing today as a conservation area because people living with wildlife within the same space, uh, these are the kind of conflicts that we are facing. In line with the conflicts as well, we have a problem with elephants, especially um, utilizing the same limited space with human uh, and livestock. Uh, they are also competing for natural resources at the same time. And therefore, uh, there's also a huge conflict between the people and the elephants within the uh, conservation area. Lack of uh, sustainable uh, Income is also a big challenge that we are facing because of the nature of the conservancy. It's not really easy for us as a conservation area to quickly make money or to come up with um, uh, businesses within the conservancy, especially ecotourism, which is um, the, lead, the leading business in the Mara landscape that can be able to pay or that can be able to support the conservation efforts that we are carrying. Uh, well, that we are carrying on within the conservancy. Therefore, uh, lack of the sustainable uh, income sources is also a big stumbling block to uh, running the conservation area. And therefore, we are heavily dependent on donor funding, which is not reliable. Uh, and that's why we, we look at it as a big challenge uh, today as a conservation area. Interventions, some of the interventions that we are uh, uh, doing as a conservancy. Number one, we are doing community, a lot of community engagements. Dialogue is being impressed on conservation education and social economic empowerment. 
We also um, uh, talking with the communities on securing land for biodiversity conservation. And as a result, uh, at the moment, we are able to secure 20,000 acres of land uh, for conservation under 15 year lease agreement. Our leases are leased to uh, a land holding company, which belongs to the trust. And therefore the communities are organizing themselves, of course, with our support uh, in a trust and they have a company uh, limited by shares and the, all the shares of the company belongs to the trust. And therefore that company uh, uh, limited by shares hold all the leases. In the landowners, like you see, they're in a meeting here discussing about uh, conservation and how to open their land uh, to um, for conservation so that they can benefit as well as uh, accommodate the, uh, the wildlife. We, we always say that in the Mara is the only region that wildlife are renting for space because as a conservation area, we are paying a guaranteed revenue to our landowners. There are at the moment about 330 of them uh, who are receiving um, a lease fee at the end of the month um, for the next 15 years. And uh, all these leases are probably new, are renewable at the end of the lease period in trying, because, in trying to ensure that we keep this land uh, open for conservation while deriving benefits for the landowners. The other intervention is uh, defencing. Uh, it's actually opening up the land, which is uh, fenced. People are fencing land and blocking wildlife from uh, accessing natural resources, accessing water, accessing um, salt lakes and vegetation. And therefore, um, we are working with the community, with landowners to open up the land that has been uh, uh, fenced, which is stopping wildlife from moving from point, uh, one point to the other. Uh, at, the, at the moment, so far we have over 500 acres of fenced land opened within the conservation area. So we have a total of 500 acres of, uh, 5,000 acres of critical wildlife migratory corridors that are already opened through the uh, uh, the interventions or through the conservation intervention that we are undertaking as part of a conservation area. Uh, what that means is that we are compensating landowners so that they can pull down the fences that they have put up in order to allow wildlife to move uh, freely within the conservation area. And uh, while we compensate them, we take off the fences and uh, keep them uh, in our offices. Uh, and then we utilize the materials uh, to support public institutions like schools, uh, healthcare centers, churches within the conservation area that would want to fence and uh, do afforestation within their premises. The other challenge which I mentioned was predation and the, the intervention to address that is um, the insulation. We are providing landowners with predator proof bombers. Uh, the old man that you see over there has lost over a hundred sheep in one night to a hyena. And uh, we had provided him with a predator proof bomber to ensure that his livestock or his sheep are safe at night. Uh, while we encourage landowners to uh, to be vigilant and to take care of their livestock during the day. Uh, the predator-proof bombers that we are providing to the landowners have proven to be effective more than 98%. And therefore, the landowners that have the predator-proof bombers are now uh, sleeping without any worry that they might be attacked, their livestock might be attacked by the predators at night, while for those that do not have the predator-proof bombers are uh, always on the rush, they are always um, on the watch during the night to ensure that their livestock are safe um, from predation. 
Um, the other one is the establishment of the Wildlife Tourism College of the Masai Mara. Uh, there are quite a number of challenges that are facing the Mara, which uh, I didn't mention all of them. Uh, I did mention a few, but diminishing wildlife population, habitat loss, climate change, um, unemployment of the youth, uh, human wildlife conflicts, community um, lack of uh, economic empowerment within the community, among many other challenges uh, facing the landscape and also Parliament as a conservation area. The idea of establishing the college was actually to provide solutions to uh, solving the problems that are highlighted herein. Uh, the other reason is that uh, uh, on, on matters uh, diminishing wildlife population, we've realized that there's a number of, there's habitat laws and when there's loss of habitat, the number of wildlife definitely reduces uh, within, the within the areas of conservation. Climate change is also affecting conservation in the Mara. Like prolonged drought, unpredictable rainfall, uh, rainfall patterns or weather patterns within the, uh, the landscape, among uh, others, global warming and all that are key challenges that we are facing. And in the Mara landscape, prolonged drought is a manifestation of what climate change is. And uh, the college is providing that opportunity to give solutions to all those challenges that we are facing as a landscape. At the moment, it has it is training youths to create employability skills, uh, but also to provide them with the skills and knowledge to address the challenges that we are facing, that we are talking about, uh, challenges that are facing the Mara landscape. The college is also providing a platform for women to, for socioeconomic empowerment for our women. In the, within the conservation area. The pictures that you see here are pictures of women that are doing bed work and are selling the artifact to our guests at the Wildlife Tourism College. Because the Wildlife Tourism College has uh, an hospitality wing as well with 40 beds, and therefore the women of the within the conservancy are given an opportunity to come and uh, uh, provide a market, uh, I mean, to, to come and sell their goods, their uh, bid works item for uh, at the camp. Uh, the camp is there for providing a business, a market for the women in the effort of building their uh, socioeconomic uh, capacities. We also support education as a conservation area. How we do that, uh, we provide uh, bursaries for our school going children. The landowners uh, together with the conservancy are teaming up to uh, have teamed up and we have established a bursary uh, kitty or fund where the landowners are contributing into it. And the conservancy matches a shilling for a shilling of all the money of the money that is that, that is con contributed by the landowners. How we do it is that um, uh, we give bursaries every school opening. When school opens every semester or term, uh, uh, the landowners, children of the landowners are entitled to a bursary. This is not a favor that is done to anyone. It is an entitlement for every single child of a landowner who is going to, uh, to in high school and in tertiary level um and it's done every quarter the picture to the left to the right of this photo of this slide is a photo of the land of landowners committee or the trustees um in a bursary allocation uh, exercise they are actually uh, going through scrutinizing the uh, paper i mean uh, the list of kids or children to ensure that uh, all the landowners 
children uh, have access to the bursaries equitably. We also uh, work with school going children on conservation matters, uh, especially uh, utilizing the, uh, the volunteers or the guests at our wildlife tourism college. Edu Africa uh, has a volunteers program within the conservancy, which, which is hosted by the college and they go out on a daily basis to meet school going children among other and even the youths within the conservancy to ensure that uh, education conserv conservation education is enhanced within uh, the, uh, the conservancy starting from the school going children to the youth and escalated to the landowners. We also promote the Maasai culture as a conservancy. We, we, particip we participated, I, I know most of you must have heard about the cultural event or week, the cultural festival, which, were, which happened last week, organized by the Narok County government, uh, the county government of Narok, Kajado, and Sampuru. The three county governments are county governments from Maasai land uh, uh, communities, and they all came together to support uh, the Maasai culture. They are promoting the, the Maasai culture to the world, but also trying to cultivate the culture to the younger generations uh, with, uh, so that uh, the culture is not eroded. Because with education and civilization today, most of the very critical and uh, important cultural aspects are being left out. And uh, I think it was a good move by all the stakeholders, uh, uh, the, the government and also conservation actors all came together, joined hands to ensure that conservation, I mean, the, the massive culture is being embraced by the landowners I mean, by the, the, the future generations and uh, also appreciated by the world. The other thing that we do, the other intervention, is that we provide uh, safe drinking water to the communities. This is a natural spring among many other water projects that we've uh, done as a conservancy, which um, is protected. The water is piped six kilometers um, uh, to the west and three kilometers to the north of the spring uh, to provide water access to clean and safe water for more than 5,000 families living within Panama Conservation Area. Sorry, uh, not families, but uh, households. And when I, when I call household uh, 5,000, You've seen um, uh, the landowners of Parnamada 800 uh, in number. But a household is a, a, a mother with children, uh, people that cook from the same kitchen and live in the same room. And in our communities, a polygamous uh, community where you would find people with three, two, four, uh, to some with more than 10 wives. And therefore, that's why the numbers uh, are, are quite many. Um, and on the uh, right, left side, uh, that's we are flagging off a road. That's the uh, the, narrow, the the member of parliament with um, one of the financier as um, is from Bescamp Explorer Foundation, flagging off a road which is being. Um, in Maram, uh, and a total of 70 kilometers of roads are today are open in Panama Conservation Area. Uh, the roads are not only open for conservation, but also to create access and uh, by the community to the market, the healthcare centers within the conservation, uh, to, within, the con within and outside the conservation area. And therefore, uh, this is, uh, important for the community mobility. Wildlife monitoring and research is one of the other um, interventions that we have within the conservation area. Our ranchers are collecting data for wildlife. 
They are also providing security. They are also um, uh, identifying sick animal and conducting the Kenya Wildlife Service for treatment. The pictures that you see here is uh, a picture of an elephant that is being treated um, by the vet from the Kenya Wildlife Service and the photo of our ranchers on patrol. Uh, they also take part in collecting uh, data uh, using um, Earth Rancher. Uh, and the volunteers on the other hand are also collecting data um, on transect. You can see a vehicle there with gira two giraffes um, on the side. And uh, those are the Edu Africa volunteers that are also supporting us as a conservation area to ensure that we have enough wildlife data within the conservancy. Other interventions is environment, environmental conservation, like um, the volunteers are also playing a very critical role in uh, taking out the invasive species. This is the, the Tria Stramonia uh, plant that's being uprooted by the volunteers. They move around the conservancy to ensure that all the invasive species, invasive species that are uh, found within the conservancy are pulled out and destroyed to uh, stop them from taking over the rangelands. Uh, among the other activities that they, they do is uh, they, they also help in uh, conserving our soil, control of soil erosion, especially in, you know, on our roads and in some other gullies that are found within the conservancy. The volunteers are doing a very critical work in ensuring that uh, there, uh, there, there is soil retention within uh, the conservation area. Um, we we also are working in partnership with several other partners. Like the photo you see here is a photo of a um, partner from the South Africa Wildlife College, uh, our donors, Wildlife Tourism College, and the Panama Conservation Area. And there's also a photo of um, the, the county government of Sampuru. Uh, coming to benchmark on the work that we are doing at Pardamat so that they can replicate this uh, in their conservation area. Meaning uh, Pardamat is now becoming a very good model that everybody wants to uh, copy. And we've been receiving uh, people uh, all over the country and even abroad coming to benchmark to see how uh, we, we are uh, uh, conducting or how we are carrying on conservation especially in this unique uh, conservation model. Um, I mentioned about um, lack of uh, income streams or sustainable income uh, st revenue streams for the conservancy. And uh, in the effort of ensuring the sustainability of the conservation area, for us to be able to sustain all the interventions that I mentioned earlier, all the conservation efforts that we are carrying on today, uh, we are embarking on um, sustainability plans within the conservancy. And uh, educate, I mean, uh, uh, ecotourism is one of them. Today, Parliament has two camps, that uh, has two uh, ecotourism camps, um, a public airstrip, a commercial livestock enterprise and carbon development is also one venture that we also, together with the landscape, uh, the Mara uh, landscape, are embracing on. Uh, the, I will talk about the commercial livestock enterprise. When we started this conservancy, be, uh, because of its nature, uh, ecotourism did not seem to be uh, viable from the start. And uh, that's why we embarked on a commercial livestock enterprise. And uh, we, in 2017, we started acquiring steers from the community, fattening in trying to pilot the project. Uh, and 
we had fattened steers for one year in 2017. In 2018, we had made some very significant uh, profits from the steers. Uh, and then we fundraised to ensure that we have our own steers as a conservancy. And at the moment, uh, the project has uh, had about uh, 150 steers, which are at the moment being sold uh, to the market uh, for a profit. And um, the challenges that we are facing is climate change. Like I mentioned, prolonged drought are really a big uh, stumbling block to the success of, it's really a stumbling block to the success of that project. Uh, because of the drought, the project seemed to be uh, a bit uncertain. However, um, we, 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 we are working on strategies on how we can um, uh, ensure that the project is sustainable. Uh, apart from an, uh, using the project, the livestock project is an income generating activity. The livestock project is also acting as a, a rental and management tool. In most of the uh, conservation areas, people are using fire as a management tool. But in the Mara instead, uh, we are using livestock as a conservation uh, a management tool. Instead of setting fire on our ranch lands, we are mowing the grass using the cattle. And on the other hand, the same cows, uh, cattle can convert the grass into cash. Because when you have uh, livestock grazing within the conservancy, you don't need tall grass. Um, the cows will help you to cut the grass. Then they add weight sell, uh, and earn money. And therefore, this becomes... Um, a very good management tool that has also, uh, 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 I mean, that earns you an income at the end of the day. Uh, I mentioned about uh, we're developing carbon. We are working with the uh, One Mara Carbon Project through the support of MMWCA to ensure that uh, uh, we are able to sell carbon in the Mara landscape. And uh, what we are doing as a conservancy is just to add value to what we already have. Uh, carbon uh, measurement of carbon has been done within the conservancy, and now we have a baseline, a baseline where we need to work to improve on the current status so that we can be able to sell carbon at the end of the day. And therefore, we are working with uh, the Mara the one mara carbon uh, project to ensure that carbon uh, cell is realized within the landscape. And that this can be uh, another uh, added revenue stream for the mara landscape and for us as a conservancy. All the work that we are doing, we are doing in partnership. It's not possible to do that by yourself. We are doing with, in partnership with other stakeholders, like you can see uh, all the stakeholders that are holding our hands to ensure that we realize the work that we are doing within the conservation area. Asante. Um, so it's now, now time for the question and answer se session. Um, you are welcome to use the uh, reaction tools at the bottom of the screen, or you can wave at me. Uh, we'll find a way of, of seeing. I can see Tom Tochterman already has his hand up. Tom, you're welcome to please unmute and um, ask your question. Very good. Thank you. Uh, excellent program, Jackson. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think it's going to be a success because of what Johan talked about, and that is the comprehensive nature of what you're doing, uh, attacking a lot of different sides of the of, of a similar problem. Question. Um, I, I'm intrigued by the idea of climate resilient um, cattle ranching. And the issue, I, I'm, I'm familiar with what's going on in that part of the Mara in terms of the drought and, and what's that, what that is causing. So I'd like to hear more about what you have in mind in dealing with the drought for cattle. And second, uh, related to that, how are you managing the number of cattle that graze in the conservation area? 
is there a formula that landowners have to abide by in terms of the you know how many cattle they can have per acre or how do you manage that thank you um jackson i'm there you go there you go yeah thank you um was it again, Tom? Yeah. Uh, yes. On uh, on the on how we are managing the livestock within the conservancy, we already have already engaged experts to come up with the carrying capacity uh, with the of the of the land. And uh, the expert says with the type of cow that we have within uh, the Mara, which some of it, some of them are. The zebu cows, uh, one cow is to five acres, and it's quite a challenge in trying to maintain the current capacity. Because the challenge we have today is that uh, uh, the Masai community really like cows. Their life revolves around the cows. Their wealth is in the number of livestock and not uh, in, in cash. And therefore, people would always want to have as many livestock as they would want. Um, it's a big challenge. And at the moment, we we are at one is to one, one cow per acre. Uh, that's where we are at the moment. Uh, while we are working towards uh, the one uh, cow per five acres. So it's just one step because from the unknown to at least now one cow per acre. It's, it's, it's challenging, but we are trying to uh, work on that. In dealing with climate change, uh, especially drought issues or for our livestock, it's just impressing the current capacities. That's the only way we can be able to uh, uh, avoid the effects of climate change. Otherwise, there's no any other way around, around that rather than ensuring that within the conservancies, we are observing the uh, right carrying capacities for our livestock. Uh, holistic grazing is also another uh, approach where we, 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 you know, we're ensuring that bunching of cows and responsible grazing is happening to ensure uh, that uh, uh, range land, uh, uh, our rangelands are improved. We are also utilizing our uh, mobile bombers because the livestock that we have within the conservancy are uh, housed in mobile bombers. Then we're shifting mobile bombers uh, across the ranch land to ensure that uh, we improve the soil um, of, uh, of the ranch lands and therefore better grasses comes out. Thank you. Um, Jackson, I know that I asked you to to stop sharing, but there is a request in the chat that I've seen um, from Sabil from Sabil Reedmiller. Um, which patch of the map is Padamat? Could you please just point that out to us on the map? Perhaps um, if somebody wants to come and visit you, they know where you are. Who knows where Kenya is? Then uh, in Kenya, that's where we are located. Uh, there's a narrow pointing to where the Mara landscape is. Uh, then uh, bottom uh, right of the screen is a map of the landscape, and probably can zoom into it. Wonderful. Thank you. So let me let me my. My screen is a bit is hanging, but anyway, uh, yeah. If you if you can um, look at the Mara ecosystem map, there's a narrow pointing to a brown patch, which is uh, Panama Conservation Area. All the other there's a dark green, and I don't I don't know the other color. Is it green or whatever? <laughs> then there's a brown. <laughs> maybe, the, maybe, maybe the ladies can help, but then uh, there's a green uh, somewhere, yeah. 
There we go. Now we zoomed in. Thank you so much. We can now see it clearly. Do you now see it uh, better? Absolutely, yes. Oh, great. So that's where Parliament is in the context of the modern landscape. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. I'm yeah, here move. you go. I put, I put the right map. So Parliament is uh, this um, brown or beige, I don't know. Uh, yes. Pardon my colorblind. Yeah. Thank you so much for clearing that up. Um, let's move yep. on to the next question. Um, question from Munene Mugambi. How can we ensure that coexistence, coexistence projects such as the one of Pardamat is uh, recognized by the government as an adaptation strategy through a rangeland governance policy? That's a loaded, complicated question. Yeah, it is, but uh, I'll give an attempt. Uh, um, Parliament Conservation Area has a management plan. I did not mention that, which is uh, duly registered with the government of Kenya, registered and gazetted with the, by the government of Kenya. Uh, and today, the government of Kenya recognizes conservation as a uh, as a land use model. Uh, about ten years ago, or even less than that, about five years ago, yeah, ten years ago, conservation was not recognized as a land use in Kenya. Today, it's recognized in law, and uh, Parliament Conservation Area is also recognized by government as a land use. And therefore, it's fully being supported by government. And that's why when you look at uh, our partnership, the people that are supporting us, the, uh, the Kenyan government, the county government, the Kenya government through the Kenya Wildlife Service are coming in handy to support the conservation efforts within uh, Padama Conservation Area. The, yeah, probably uh, financing, the financing part uh, could be what the government now needs to come in to support uh, the, the work done by donors, by communities, by conservationists in the matter, because that is the only lacking uh, uh, bit of support that we need from government. Thanks, Jackson. I see most of the uh, questions are heading towards the towards the chat this evening. Um, let's go for the next one. I'm not sure if it's Saka or Kaka Karrison. Thank you so much, Jackson, for this beautiful talk. I have two questions. Now, the first one, how are the livestock owners preventing the disease spreading uh, from the wildebeest with the defencing? And then the second one, why is the, the hyenas and not the lions that are the main predators in the area? Thank you again. Thank you. Um, the malignant cattle fever uh, is caused by wild beasts. It's not. Uh, it's not prevented through defencing. People are trying to prevent it by fencing off the wild beast, so they don't access their land. Um, what we are trying to do as a conservation area, it's just in creating opportunities for people to make uh, uh to earn a living to to benefit to maximize the benefits that are accrued from wildlife conservation so that even when one loses a cow or so to wild beast then of course they appreciate because it could be that they bought that cow from monies through conservation so what we are doing we're just ensuring that uh, conservation is paying uh, uh, so that people can tolerate um, the, 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 the challenges they are facing related to um, livestock diseases from wildlife. And what, what they are doing is that uh, we encourage people, we know areas that are not uh, breeding zones for wildebeest. During the calving season, or the for the wild beast, 
uh, livestock keepers are encouraged to take their livestock to uh, those uh, zones, and then of the breeding season they would breed, they would graze uh, on breeding zones. So the beauty with that is that uh, there are known breeding zones for wild beasts. It's not everywhere in the landscape, and therefore uh, we are able to circumvent around that or to avoid. Uh, the other one was on predators, uh, predation, why the hyena? Uh, Correct, and not the lions. I really don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why it's the hyena, but the problem is uh, lions, uh, lions are always smart uh, predators. They would sneak into um, a boma, take one cow for food, and eat. But the challenge with the hyena, they get into the sheep pen because they kill sheep most of the time, not cows. And they will always think that they can eat everything in the pen. They don't know that they, just, they need them tomorrow. So they kill at the same time. You could find one hyena killing 100 sheep. That go. That's why that's the problem. Out of greed, they kill a lot. They kill more than they can eat. While a hyena, uh, a lion can only kill one for for food and that's it so that's the difference between that's why we're saying hyenas are the most dangerous ones because lions will always kill one cow while a hyena would kill many hmm. unfortunately a bit of a of a anthropogenic trait there um then a question from selo maluleka from tut i'm grateful for the talk very much appreciated jackson my question is, how are the individuals affected by the predation compensated? It, um, are they as part of that, at the moment, we are not compensating. What we are doing instead, when you lose your livestock, we are installing a predator-proof bomber for you so that you don't continue, you don't lose your livestock any further. That's what we, what we are doing at Pardamat. But I, like I mentioned, most of the landowners in Parliament are landowners of either Nabosho or Maranoth. The two conservancies have a, compens a consolation scheme. They don't call it a, a, con a compensation, it's called a consolation, where they are paying something small. Uh, they are consoling with the, with, the, with the livestock keepers that are losing their livestock to predators because you cannot be able to compensate the market value. So we are giving them some. They are giving them something small to say sorry. Uh, for there's a price for a sheep. There's a price for a a, a pet for a cow, or a cattle, and so on. So those so those two uh, consultants are compensating. While on our end, we are not trying. We are not compensating. We are just trying to solve their problem by ensuring that we don't lose livestock to predation. But the government of Kenya, through the Kenya Wildlife Service have a, compens a compensation program to compensate uh, for livestock, uh, uh, for property lost and also lives of the people uh, uh, that, are, that are lost through uh, wildlife or human uh, wildlife conflicts. So uh, that's the only compensation body which is the government of Kenya uh, that's doing that. And uh, probably they're, they're doing, yeah. No, go ahead. They are doing, they're, they're doing uh, 5 million shilling for life lost and uh, also based on the market value of any property damage, be it livestock lost or uh, crops or any other, any other kind of property, then they pay uh, a market price or value to, to, to property. Right, then a, a question from Felix Carreto. Um, two questions. Um, another double barrel question. Apart from the Datura stramonium being an invasive species, which is the other invasive species and will you eradicate them? That's the first question. Then the second question, the adjacent communities around the Conservancy can block wildlife corridors, which may cause human wildlife conflict. How can you reduce this? What's the last question? Uh, the last one. The last one was on um, human wildlife conflict due to the communities blocking the corridors. 
uh, where wildlife move and he's asking how can you reduce this yeah um thank you uh, uh the the main invasive species that we have within the conservancy is the datura that's the main one that we have here uh the and Otherwise, there, there could be other invasive species like the cactus, but they are very minimal. They are not uh, significant. It's not worth talking about. But on the wildlife corridors, what we are doing, we are compensating landowners. We are buying off them uh, the materials. We are paying them the cost of putting up a fence so that they can pull down that, those fences in order to create the free movement of wildlife. And that's why I I, 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 talk, I had a whole slide on defencing program where 5,000 acres of land have been opened already. Those are 5,000 acres of land uh, in wildlife, in critical wildlife corridors. So that is the intervention that we are employing and the landowners are embracing uh, the same to ensure that uh, we minimize these conflicts because um, we, we, we've had issues or cases where people are being, uh, you know, uh, colliding with elephants because they have no um, uh, room or there is limited space due to fencing. And uh, when while we defense, we then we create more space and therefore wildlife will have their own room and, you know, people with their livestock can also have room to move freely without necessarily colliding or um, interacting on the way. Thanks, Jackson. Just to return to his first question, um, he also asked, how are you eradicating the um, invasive species? Oh, yeah, yeah. So uh, the eradication of the invasive species, I've uh, said uh, we, we are employing uh, um, the labor of the volunteers from the Edu Africa that are being hosted at the Wildlife Tourism College. Like I mentioned, the Wildlife Tourism College is providing a um, solution to most of the problems that we are facing as a conservation area. Then we have um, volunteers within that program that are coming to work for us, both in manual labor, technical um, aspect, and all that in conservation. And um, and therefore we are using them to pull down, to manually pull down the um, invasive species within uh, the conservation area. Otherwise, uh, there's no any other way of dealing with that because we could, we cannot use um, uh, you know, uh, chemicals to kill them. It might be uh, detrimental to the environment. And therefore we are, employing that manual labor to ensure that we eradicate the invasive species. So uh, there's a question here from, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and pronounce the name correctly, so forgive me if I don't. I think it's Njapit Jeff. Um, hello, I have a question. What's the community perception on the fencing removal in the area? I believe you have touched on that. Um, you yeah. mentioned we are paying them to 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 remove the fences. Um, so I guess the question is uh, then: Is it working? Um, it, does financial compensation um, provide enough uh, reward for them to to see it in a positive light? Yeah. In addition to compensating for fences, we are uh, the, the 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 incentive for landowners to pull down the fence is so that they can join our lease leasing program. We cannot lease land or pay for leases on land that is under a fence. So there's a monthly income that goes into a, any given family that opens their land by pulling down a fence. And therefore, yeah, there's uh, incentive, uh, you know, um, the incentives for people to pull down fences, not only the compensation, but in the long run, in the long run, now the the the, the monthly income from uh, leases, but also the it qualifies them to access a bursary for their school going children. Wow, um, 
I see a lot of people are saying thank you for these answers, and I must echo that because your answers really reflect all the careful thinking that goes into planning your um, the, the management of the area and coming up with good, comprehensive answers to the challenges that you face. I mean, you you address this issue that I just mentioned in three different ways, which is really amazing. Um, it's 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 really impressive, and I hope that the students are really learning tonight. Um, I see another co comment coming in from Carol Preston. There is a family just outside Arusha that have rehabilitated the land on their farm to the extent that there are giraffes on it now. Exciting that all they did was leave the land alone to rehabilitate itself, except that they eradicate the invasive species um, that Jackson talks about. So yeah, it just shows that it can work. Yep. Um, another question coming up. Um, how do you incorporate the uh, Maasai indigenous knowledge in fostering coexistence? Sorry, come up again for that. How do, How do you, you incorporate the Maasai indigenous knowledge in fostering coexistence? Oh, yeah. Um, thank you for that, Christian. Um, I was born and raised in the Mara. This is my home, home, home. And uh, the Maasai traditionally, or from time immemorial, coexisted with wildlife. It's not... It's, it's not something new they are coming to encounter as a result of conservation. What we are doing today is uh, just ensuring that the communities are not only suffering by tolerating or accommodating one life, but also they are benefiting. Otherwise, Maasai people traditionally are conservationists. And I have a very interesting story that I want to share with you. Um, in our culture, it's, 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 it's a taboo to eat wild meat. And I think that is the reason why uh, the Maasai for many years, for ages, were able to coexist, to conserve and conserve our life. When I was a young boy, we were herding and we used to have a community called Robos in the Maasai, uh, in, in the Maasai community. It's a, a clan called Robos. And these people are uh, hunters. They rely on 100% on game meat. And one day I was uh, looking after cows. Uh, as a young boy, uh, I left home by 7, coming back, 7 a.m. and coming back home by 6 p.m. So I had my lunch, breakfast at 6 before I left home at 7. While I was herding, I, you know, I found the hunters with a barbecue of zebra, and um, I was hungry, of course, yeah. And uh, they offered to give me some uh, bitings. Uh, the the meat of zebra have a smell that is not liked by the cows. And after I ate the cow, the zebra meat, the cows ran home way earlier than usual. And my uncle was like. What's wrong with the cows? They are coming earlier home and you guys are away from the cows. Then approaching him, he smelled that we ate zebra meat. What happened? We were excommunicated from home. We were not allowed to eat any cow, uh, livestock product because we went, uh, you know, we went against the norms of the community. And, you know, it was a big deal. It took the community elders to come back, you know, and uh, do a cleansing ceremony for us to be accepted back home uh, as now livestock keepers and not hunters. Otherwise, we were supposed to have been considered as hunters and go to the bush. So that's how serious it is. That's what makes the community, the massive community, Conserve, naturally conserve wildlife because it's not in their culture to eat the livestock. I mean, the, the, the meat from, the, the game meat. So yeah, that's how serious it is. And that's how culture is supporting conservation within 
the, uh, among the master communities. Thank you for that answer. I love it when somebody says, I'm going to tell you a story. And that was a beautiful story. Um, there's another question from Felix. I have a question. I think seasonability is one of the f factors influencing the distribution of wildlife populations. So how do you as a manager control the population structure of, of wild animals during dry season so as to balance the ecosystem? Oh, it's a tough one. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a tough one because um, Pardamat is a dry season range for elephants and uh, other big mammals because I mentioned about, uh, uh, I mentioned of water access throughout the year within the conservancy. It's really not easy to control the numbers of wildlife Perhaps it could be easy to control the number of livestock, but not wildlife, because wildlife naturally moves depending on, you know, seasons of the year. During the dry season, you would find some abundance in elephants and other uh, giraffes and other big wildlife species. You know, and during the rainy season, then the numbers of wild uh, elephants reduces uh, within the conservation. So it's really a very natural, um, it, 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 it's, it's a natural movement. And really, we cannot be able to control the movement of wildlife within the conservancy because it's an open system and wildlife move to different places and locations of the landscape depending on the need depending the, on, on the availability of what they require at a time. It, it could be salt leaks. Then they require salt leaks. They could be in parliament in numbers because there are, of, there are salt leaks in parliament. If they, they require tall grass, it could be down in the national reserve, especially during the rain season. Elephants will be in the national reserve to you know graze in, in, in the plains of the national reserve. So you cannot really control number of I mean, the wildlife movement within the area. It naturally controls itself. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so a question from Tom, and that is, do you track predator-prey ratios in Padamat? Morgan? Do you track the predator to prey ratios in Padamat? Track predators to? The the predator the, the ratio of predators to prey. Do you track that on Padamat? Oh. No, no, we don't. We don't. We don't. Uh, but um, as well, uh, the predators in PCA as no are not as many because of the population because of the human activities within the conservancy and that's why you find uh yeah i think we have we, we don't have enough prey within the conservancy and that's why we have a lot of um predation on livestock so uh it, there's an imbalance but we are not tracking that one we it's, it's something that we'll need to Probably and thank you for raising that. It's something that it's an assignment that we we'll probably need to give ourselves to ensure that uh, we track that one. Thank you very much. Um, another question from Felix: uh, Which are the modern ways of monitoring wild animals, especially the carnivores and the nocturnal animals? Um, we are using camera tracks. Traps, sorry, we are using camera traps to uh, monitor uh, the nocturnals. Uh, yeah, so that's the uh, technology we are using to ensure that we we see all the nocturnals um, within the conservancy. Fantastic, thank you. And then there's a there's a thank you from uh, Nankukuleku Makabong from TUT on behalf of the TUT, that's the Chwane University of Technology that trains a lot of the game rangers in South Africa. On behalf of their students and nature conservation staff, we'd like to thank you, Mr. Sisani, for the wonderful talk 
It was very informative and really inspiring. And many other um, thank yous coming in. Um, Jackson, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, to Felix, I'd like to say I've heard it said that life is about asking the right questions, and I think you're you're on the right track. Keep on asking questions. Please keep on joining us. Um, I just want to to um, Tom Tochterman that joined us tonight. Um, a little story myself. I slept in the bed at Nonwane uh, where the Mozambique spitting cobra attacked you. So I slept very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> I looked twice under the bed. <laughs> oh, that's awesome! You're, you're, I have I have PTSD, post traumatic snake disorder, because of that incident, and I could uh, go into it, but I won't. <laughs> Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> happy that you survived. Very happy. <laughs> Me too. Uh, Thank you, everybody. Um, oh, I see there's, a, there's another question coming up. Um, Felix, uh, am I free to ask more questions? Yes, but let's try and let's try and end the session in the next five minutes. I think we've been holding um, Jackson for a long time and he might still have to drive home. So let's make it one last question, please. Oh, the most dangerous snake in the world. It's not a South Africa. Mama. Australia. Yeah. It's a Mozambique spitting cobra in your bed. <laughs> <laughs> the most dangerous snake is the, the one. <laughs> it's the one you have, yes, exactly. Well, the most dangerous one in the Mara is the uh, black mamba. I, I, I would agree. Yeah. Yes, yeah thank you everybody um we really enjoyed your company tonight jackson thank you very much for um entertaining us and and informing us in a massive way it was really very very informative and for the example that you set in managing a protected area um it's, <clears throat> it's fascinating and please keep an eye on the share screen africa website as we will be informing you on the first um, events in the Masai Mara series very, very soon. Yeah, thank you everyone. And uh, it was really a great pleasure and an honor to talk to you guys. And uh, thank you for listening and hope uh, this has been sensible and uh, is informative to the work that you're doing. Thank you, Shana. Thank you. Thank you everybody.